Good morning. morning. Welcome to Warsaw Baptist Church. My name is Ken. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm glad to have you here if you're in the room, if you're watching from home or on vacation somewhere. We're glad you're with us too. Uh, We are now in the summer summer weeks where (laughs) where we see a lot of people traveling, so uh, we will be praying for their uh, safe returns. Um, We have a couple of prayers that we want to get uh, announced before we get going. Um, We want to keep praying for Ashlyn. Uh, She is back in the hospital again. This is Dolores' great-grandniece with a spiked fever again and with all the other trouble. They're, they're, you know, having to keep a very close eye. So just be praying that they get some answers as to why it keeps spiking and and, uh, some solutions, too. Uh, We want to see this baby better and and growing strong. So uh, keep praying for uh, the Ukraine... uh, Brothers and sisters who are worshiping today, uh, 116th day since the invasion, and they are still there in Kiev, uh, singing praises to God, preaching through the pain. Um, it's uh, it's it's something that, again, it seems like our our news cycle has forgotten most of it, but uh, but we do want to remember those who are still uh, struggling to get together for worship, um, and uh, just thank God for the the universal church that we're a part of. Um, any other prayers before we get started? Praises? All right. Um, let me pray, and then we'll go through a couple more announcements. Father God, we come here to worship you. We come here to sing praises, to hear your word, to gather and fellowship with one another. And Lord, we, we don't want to take lightly the privilege of doing this. Lord, we want to always remember uh, what a steep cost uh, Christians have paid throughout the centuries to make things like this seem normal to us. Lord, we most of all want to remember the the cost that you paid for us. Lord, in your blood, in your sacrifice, you allow us to come together. And Lord, As we get into a time of worship, we have these others on our hearts and minds. We have Ashlyn on our heart, and Lord, we don't we don't know what's uh, what's going to be found out. But we just pray that your comfort and your healing would uh, just touch that little girl. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine and and throughout the world where this sort of gathering is not as easy. Lord, please. Be with them, strengthen them, encourage them, and help them to stay steadfast in the faith, despite all the obstacles they're facing. Lord, we ask these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, a couple of announcements. Um, Baby bottles, uh, they're they're due today. Obviously, we have several people on vacation, so they're going. I'm still going to be collecting them until next week. the basket's heavy, so I might have one of the young backs <laughs> move it back to my office <laughs> after the service. Um, we have a food truck delivery tomorrow, right? Tomorrow at 1030. Um, so if you are not at work or at school, you're not at school, um, and you have the ability to come and help unload the truck and restock the shelves, we'd really appreciate that. Um, Another thing with the food pantry, um, we have two different sides of the food pantry. One is the commodities, that's what the truck is coming to bring us stuff from the state. But then we have another part of the food pantry that is just stuff donated directly to our church. And the commodities we can give to families once a month and the stuff that's donated to the church, we can give anytime. So if you can spare it, um, there's a list on Facebook and I think there's a slide on here. Um, if you can spare it, there's uh, several needs for to, to get that food pantry replenished. We need some more vegetables, some spaghetti sauce, pasta sauce, pasta. That is way too small, probably. Can you read it? Yeah, okay. Uh, it's not like that one thing I printed out for you. Um, the, uh, the, the one thing we don't need is mixed vegetables. We are, we're lousy with mixed vegetables, so um, you, you don't need to bring those. But uh, um, hot dogs or other freezer meats, um, Anything helps uh, as the gas prices have gone up, as the food prices have gone up. We have seen an uptick in the number of people coming to the church side, so we want to just continue to be able to 
to help them. We haven't had to turn anybody away as of yet, so uh, just uh, take a look at the list. Again, it's on Facebook. If you can pick up an extra thing or two when you're at the store, we'd appreciate it. Um, we have VBS. Uh, it's going to be starting on August 1st. It'll go August 1st, 2nd, and 3rd in the evenings. That's Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Uh, if you want to help with that, please see Abby Bell or uh, the Hoppertons. And uh, also, we have a sunrise ride. It's a motorcycle ride that's uh, raising money for Sunrise Children's Services. Randall from Oakland is, is organizing that. And Logan, who I think is upstairs somewhere, um, he, he's going to be our point person for that. So if you want to help with that, I think the, the, the last stop is going to be at Paint Lick, and they're going to have, you know, cookout and music and stuff like that. So if you want to help with that or donate to it, um, see Logan, and he'll be able to give you some more information on that. I didn't put it on the slides, but we are not going to have a fellowship lunch in July because it's July 3rd, which is July 4th weekend, and, uh, and we know that, that we're we're pressing a lot of different schedules that, that day, or that, that weekend. So uh, just for July, we're not going to have the fellowship lunch, but then we'll jump back into it. Um, I'm going to read a passage from 1 Corinthians to get us started, and then we'll get into a time of worship. At Warsaw Baptist Church, we worship in three primary ways, in our singing, and our giving, and in the preaching and hearing of God's Word. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 50, says, I tell you this, brothers. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For the perishable body must put on imperishable, and this, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on the immortality, then, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, O death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now we're going to get into a time of singing and uh, as I say Every week, I think, um, the musicians are not here to perform for you. Uh, they are leading in worship. And this week, we are, uh, as you can see, at a skeleton crew. I think we were at a skeleton crew last week. Now we're just Lazarus in the tomb. Uh, so, so, uh, so it's going to be me and Monica. Um, and, uh, and so you just need to sing to the Lord and, uh, and, and know that this is not a performance. <laughs> So we're going to get started. This is not my comfort zone, so everybody sing nice and loud. Uh, first one's going to be Everlasting God.
This one is new. We posted it on Facebook, so hopefully you know the song a little bit. Sing along. You breathe the breath of new life into me, offering grace.
not going to happen. <laughs> All right, we're going to release the kids to nursery. I think, Heather, are you covering it? All right, thank you <laughs> for that. Uh, we, we do want to thank all of our volunteers. Um, I do not like doing what I just did, but we have volunteers here. We are a small church, so we are never mad when our volunteers can't show up. <laughs> We've got a nursery worker who's sick today, and Heather's going to fill in for her. Uh, we do thank all of you who are volunteers and, and all the ways that you do help this church. Uh, let's pray for the kids, and then we'll get into the message. Father God, thank you for the children of this church. Thank you so much for our volunteers. Lord, as they go back, I pray that you would just uh, shower them with love. And Lord, help us to see our role when they come back as the primary disciple makers of their little hearts. Lord, help us to teach them and instruct them in the way they should go. And Lord, we just thank you for the, the, the children that you just keep on bringing into this church. I pray these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Kids can go back. All right. Now, if everybody else can go ahead and turn into 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, uh, if you're in a pew Bible, which is the hardback blue Bible near you in the pew, it's on page 952 and following. 1 Corinthians, it's uh, the second letter that Paul has in the, in the New Testament here. And I'm going to read a short passage, and then we're going to give an overview of the whole book. Uh, so when you get to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, go ahead and stand for the reading of God's Word. We're going to read just a few verses to get started. Paul writes in chapter 2, starting in verse 1, And I... When I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of of God. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Let's pray. Father God, your word is so comforting when we read it as you've delivered it. Lord, I'm about to preach a message from a book that so many times has just been thrown at Christians as a rule book, as a bunch of do's and don'ts. And Lord, if we miss the gospel that begins this book and 
continues throughout this book, we will, we will go off into so many damaging directions. Lord, this book does teach us to take sin seriously. And at the same time, this book tells us that there is only one answer to our sin problem. It is not external change. It is not behavioral change in and of itself. It's got to be a changed heart based on the gospel truth. So Lord, help me to unpack this book in a way that, that brings your name and your fame to the forefront. Help us to see what you say we need to walk away from, but help us to more and more and more see you. I ask these things in Jesus' perfect and precious name. And all God's people said, amen. This is an overview series, uh, this cover-to-cover -cover series. This is an uh, overview that is not going to unpack everything in the book of 1 Corinthians. I can't do that in one hour. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this book and, and pick out three main ideas, all right? So um, if you were to break down the structure of this book, it starts with a gospel opening, and that's what we're going to spend a lot of time in today, verses 1 through 9 of chapter 1. And then there's like 15 chapters of correction. So have you ever heard somebody say, I wish we could just go back to the, to the first century church? I wish we could just get back to the basics. I wish we could just get back to the purity of the first churches. If you've heard somebody say that, you might want to read with them through 1 Corinthians and say, I don't really want to be like that church. Like, this is the most, I don't know, it's crazy. It is a crazy church. They, they sinned in, in ways that even the pagans around them were saying, you did what? It, it, was, it, was, it was a terrible representative of Christ there in Corinth. And so when Paul writes, there's 15 chapters of correction. And, and what he does is he just breaks down, okay, this is the issue I heard about, this is the issue you wrote about, here's the gospel, here's Christ and why Christ has changed how you live. This is why, because of who you are in Christ, that you should no longer live the way you are living. And it's 15 chapters of that, and then the last chapter is just a, a few closing remarks. Unlike Romans, if you were here last week and you were here with us when we preached through Romans, Romans is a, a powerful book, but it's not as personal of a book. Do you know what I mean? It, it has a lot of thick doctrine. It's a, it's a fantastic book to understand the, the law and the gospel, but there's a difference in the tone of 1 Corinthians to Romans. 1 Corinthians has lots of doctrine. 1 Corinthians has lots of good things to teach us about the law and the gospel, but 1 Corinthians is written by Paul to a church he knows intimately. He had never been to Rome, so he's writing what he thinks will be helpful. When he's writing to the Corinthians, I, I think he's got the faces of his people in mind. Like as he's writing this, he can picture the church that he spent really longer than most of the church plants that he started, and he started a bunch. He spent about a year and a half in Corinth. And so I think he's thinking back to that time with them and just thinking, what's going on? What is, what is going on with you guys? Uh, if you go to Acts chapter 18, I'm just going to get there real quick. Let me read about his stay in Corinth. And again, this is one of the longest stays that he had as he was planting churches throughout the known world in chapter 18 of verse 1, it says, After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontius, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. So he gets to Corinth, and he meets these, this couple, Priscilla and Aquila, and, and he went to see them. And, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and, and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and he tried to persuade the Jews and the Greeks. Now, this is the, the, the pattern that Paul had. 
He was a tent maker so that he could earn his keep so that he wouldn't be able to, wouldn't have to burden the, the brand new believers with any kind of, of, of financial burden. And as he goes in, he goes into every city and just goes to the synagogue if there is one. And he just starts reasoning with the Jews there because he was a Jew of Jews before he was converted. And so he knew that they were waiting for this long expected Messiah, this anointed one that was going to come and take over, that was going to come and deal with all of the problems in the world. And so every time he went into a city, he would go to the synagogue and he would teach, with them, teach them and try to reason with them and try to persuade them, whether they were Jews or Greeks in the synagogue. It says, when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that, Christ, that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, which happened in most of the cities they went to, he just shook out his garments and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I'm innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Now, this points us to a, a, a very well-known teaching in Ezekiel, where Ezekiel is told, hey, I'm going to make you a watchman and I need you to warn people, but if they don't listen to you and disaster comes, then the blood's on their own head. But if you don't speak and disaster comes, then you're responsible because they were ignorant of the disaster that was coming. So he has that idea, and then no doubt he also had what Jesus had told his disciples when Jesus was here on earth. He said, he said, when you go from town to town, if one of the towns doesn't welcome you, just dust off the, the, the shoes and start walking. Go to the next town. If they don't listen, that's on them. So he does. He says, all right, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent, and from now on I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there. He left the synagogue. And he went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, who was a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. So he walked out of the synagogue. He walked over to the other guy's house. He walked in, and he just started doing the same thing. Now he was, now he was in the culture of Corinth, even though he was just right next door. And here's what happened. His house was next door, and Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue that he just left, that he just said, all right, Blood's on your own head. That leader of that synagogue, he, he went over and listened, and, and it said he believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And then many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you or harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people." And he stayed there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. So that's how Paul was introduced and lived with Cor the Corinthians. And then he went on to plant more churches. As he left, he got word that the Corinthians had lost their minds in so many ways. Um, and so as you read 1 Corinthians this week, you're going to hear in his tone something different than you heard in Romans. You're going to hear a tough but tender voice. You're going to hear uh, heartbreak and hope. It's Father's Day. I think most of us who are dads can say, yeah, that's how I've been with my kids. There's been heartbreak and hope. I've had to be tough. I've had to be tender. I've gotten to be tender. The largest chunk of this is tough and tender. It's full of heartbreak and hope. I'm just going to quickly unpack it. It's the biggest chunk, 15 chapters. I'm just going to quickly talk about what the problems were in Corinth and how he used almost every time for almost every problem in this church, he used Jesus as the answer to the problem. So the first problem they had was divisions based upon who they liked as leaders. So I'm not going to read all these texts, but you had some in Corinth who said, oh, well, we follow Paul. And then others said, well, no, well, we follow Apollos. Now, Apollos was like Paul. He was a traveling missionary, but there was a difference with Apollo. Apollos was an incredible speaker. So Paul had the heart, gave him what he had, 
And he could write fantastic, but other places that you read, you read that he wasn't actually a good preacher. And so you had some people in the church saying, well, we follow Paul. And the other ones were like, no, we, we like the dynamic speaker. We like Apollos. And then some people were acting real high and mighty, but they're like, we just follow Jesus. You ever meet those Christians? Oh, you guys are petty. We just follow Jesus. But they say it in a way that's condescending. Anybody heard that? Okay. Um, so there's this division based on who they like as leaders, and Paul just, he says, are you kidding me? I, did I die for you? Did, did Apollos die for you? Were you baptized into my name, their name? Let me just read it real quick. I don't have it on the screen, but if you turn over to 1 Corinthians 3, 5 through 6. I'm sorry, I don't have it on the screen. Um, 1 Corinthians 3, 5 through 6, it says, What then is Apollos? What is Paul? They are servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered. But God gave the growth. So he, neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. So he says, if you get into this hero worship, you're going to destroy the church. If you say, well... I like him better than him. You are going to cause havoc to the church. Now, I've been here eight years-ish. But the first year I was here, all I heard about was the last guy. And it wasn't kind most of the time. But guess what? Tim and Ken point you to Jesus. When, when, when Austin has filled in, when Randall has preached here, pointing to Jesus. When other church leaders from other churches got up to preach at the different events that we've had, pointing to Jesus. There is no room in the church for playing favorites with leaders. Like, we are all just as messed up as you. I hope you realize that. Like, I am just as much of a work in progress as, as you are. The next problem, and it was a huge problem in the church, was sexual immorality. And, and it, was, it was sexual immorality to the point that even the people in the city were saying, did you see what the Christians are doing? There was a guy who was in a relationship with his, we don't know if it was his mother or mother-in-law, a lot of people say mother-in-law, I think, just to be less weirded out. But it, it, was, it was bad, right? And, and not only was he doing this, but the people of the church were saying, oh, yeah, in Christ we're free. We can't tell somebody not to do something because Christ said it's free. If he's sinning and we're letting it go, God's grace abounds. Now, this is the exact same thing that Paul wrote not to do in Romans. He says, if you really believe in Jesus Christ as Savior, you also have to accept him as Lord. And that means you change. There was that kind of sexual immorality. There was prostitution. People in the church going and, and uh, having an affair with the prostitutes. All kinds of wreckage. And, and, and Paul says the answer to this is start living out your identity in Christ. In Christ, you are a new creation. In Christ, you are not who you used to be. Christ is the answer to all of the, the, the things that would disrupt the unity of a church. There was also broken witness to the community because the, the people were watching the church, and you see this in chapter 5, and they were having their, you know, sexual sin. But also, when they would start arguing or disputing, they would take it to a civil court. And he's like, are you kidding me? We're preaching 
the unification of Christ and his blood over us and how it brings all these disparate groups together. And we're saying that, we're preaching that, we're telling the truth of what Jesus said, and then when people say, what are those Christians like? They see you in court arguing about petty stuff. He says, wouldn't it be better to just be wronged than to give such a, a broken testimony to the, to the culture around you? And again, where do we see that? We see that in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was wrongfully accused, but he knew that he had a mission that was greater than any civil authority. And he wasn't going to get distracted with that. He was going to be focused on the main thing. There were questions about marriage and divorce in chapter 7. There were, there were questions about, okay, person A gets saved. Their spouse does not get saved. And they're saying, so should we just divorce them? Because then we'd be une unequally yoked if we, do, if we don't divorce them. He's like, no, you've already committed. Stay committed. This is a picture of Christ and the church. If, if, if Jesus walked away from his bride every time we did something that was not equally yoked to him, he would have left us a long time ago and he would have stayed gone. He says, no, if you're, if you're married to an unbeliever, then you just love them. You love them. You, you love them and show them the gospel and perhaps, he says, perhaps they will also come to faith. Now, in the next book, in 2 Corinthians, he'll say, if you're a believer and you're not married, don't marry an unbeliever. Don't get yourself into that situation. But if you're married to an unbeliever already, stick with them. He also talks in probably the least romantic way about marriage of anybody. He says, I wish you were all able to be single like me, but if you cannot control your passions, go ahead and get married. It's not a sin. Like, that's, it's not romantic. Should we get married? Well, it's not a sin. It's not a sin. But he does. He talks about if, if, if God has, has blessed you and, and you know who you are in Christ and you feel like marriage would get in the way of that, don't get married. Serve God. If you feel like if you don't get married, the passions are going to cause you to be like one of these fools beforehand with the sexual sin, get married. It's not a sin. And then he talks about these conflicts. There's uh, chapters 8 through 10. There's these conflicts about food sacrifice to idols. And in the culture, maybe you don't know this, in the culture, they were, there were different temples for different gods all over the place. And all of these temples had a, a sacrificial system. They would sacrifice these animals. And then, you know, they didn't have refrigerators, so they had to do something with all that meat. So they would sacrifice to the idol, say their little prayers, and then they would sell the meat on the market. Some of the people who were saved came directly out of this pagan worship. And so when they saw a Christian eating some of this meat, they're like, oh, what are you doing? You can't do that. Because they tied the meat in with the the idolatry. But Paul's like, those idols are nothing. Those idols are not real. They're at best demons and they don't actually get anything from that. If you're not worshiping the idol, eat the meat. But then he also says, if eating the meat in front of one of your brothers or sisters is going to cause them to stumble, don't eat the meat. Now you might say, well, I don't know how this applies to us. Well, let's, let's use drinking. I'm, I'm a recovered alcoholic. If I take a drink, I disappear. You never see me again. But that's not everybody's problem. The Bible says very clearly that you are not to get drunk. The Bible does not say that you cannot drink. If you're of age and if you don't have an addiction... There's nothing in the Bible that says you cannot do it. But if you having a drink in front of somebody is going to cause them to stumble, don't drink. It doesn't mean never drink. Don't drink in front of them. Don't eat the meat in front of the people who think it's idolatry. And then also he says in this passage, 
He says, and watch out if you are saying, well, I have Christian liberty, I can eat this. Or if you're saying, I have Christian liberty, I can drink responsibly. He says, watch out that you don't become enamored with those idols. Watch out that you don't start worshiping those false gods. Don't, don't, don't say, well, I have liberty so I can drink bourbon and then find out that you're like me. Err on the side of caution, according to Paul. There's disordered authority in the Bible. Now, I will tell you, there's some of these things that you might say, Ken, I don't know how I feel about that passage. First Corinthians has a lot of those, okay? The next one that we're going to talk about is whether or not women should be in ministry. Now, just so you know, we're a Southern Baptist church, and the Southern Baptist Convention is right now fracturing because of this idea of whether or not women should be in eldership, pastoral, preaching ministry. Paul says no. Paul says that just as there is a role distinction between the Father and the Son and the Spirit, there are role distinctions between men and women. Now, this doesn't mean that if you have a, a role that is not in this authority position, that you are less than the person who is. Just like Jesus, who submits to the Father, is still on the same level as God. We have equality and we have differences in roles. Now, just in case you have questions about that, I went and reread a bunch of textbooks <laughs> because it's a thick passage, it's a thick couple passages, and if you have questions about that, please come see me. There's also broken communion. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this real quick. It's in 11, 20 through 22. We usually read part of chapter 11 later, but there's a broken communion. Again, communion is this picture that God gave us, that Jesus gave us to say, this is a reminder of what the gospel is. When you take the bread, when you take the cup, you're remembering that you, in your sin, had no hope of salvation. But Jesus Christ gave his life, shed his blood so that you could be saved. So when we take the bread and the cup on the first weekend of the month, we're remembering this. But he says, you have wrecked communion. And this is what he says in chapter 11. I'll start in verse 20. He says, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating it, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. So communion, this picture of the sacrificial love of God was being totally destroyed. And so anybody who was coming into the gathering who might have a picture of, want to see a picture of what the gospel was, was seeing this selfish, self-centered nonsense when it came to the Lord's Supper. Now, obviously, if you read that, you see that they're doing more than a little piece of bread and a little cup of, of, of juice, right? They had a meal. But the problem in Corinth was the rich people, they didn't have to work all day and then finally get a chance to go and worship. So they were there early, and they started eating early. And they were getting nice and full and eating up all the food. And there, it wasn't juice, it was wine. And they were drinking up all the wine and getting drunk. And then so finally the other brothers and sisters who are less fortunate, they come in and they're, they're saying, what in the world? So they were taking this beautiful picture of the gospel and trashing it. Does that make sense? So what did he do? Did he say, shame on you, what are you doing? He says, this isn't good. But let me remind you about what it is. He said, I received from the Lord what I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as, an offer, as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat and drink the bread, and, eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. He says, 
Remember who you are. Remember what this is so that you don't go back into this nonsense, this, this destruction of a gospel picture. He doesn't just say, shame on you, you're out. He says, remember who you are. Live accordingly. The next issue, and again, I've got time for coffee if you want to talk about this. He talks about the gifts of the Spirit, chapters 12 through 14. And here's, here's two camps in, main, in, in our churches, probably in this church. There's groups that say the gifts of the Spirit have ceased. They're called cessationists. cessationists. And there's people who say the gifts of the Spirit have continued. They're called continuationists. Both sides sometimes divide and cause all kinds of nonsense to go on between Christians, sometimes between churches. Paul doesn't say that they cease anywhere. But he does say when you use them, don't don't make people think you're out of your mind. When when Paul looks at the gifts of the Spirit, he, he says, we are the body of Christ, Every gift that he's given is to help the body of Christ. Just like your eyesight helps all of your body, every gift that the Spirit gives the church is to help all of the church. And he says, so use those gifts in love. And then he defines love very clearly in chapter 13. A lot of people read chapter 13 at weddings, the love chapter. That whole chapter is about how to use your spiritual gifts. And then he says also, do it in an orderly way. And again, I'm not going to read all this, but as you read it this week, he says, if you don't do this in an orderly way, outsiders are going to come in and say, they're out of their mind. I think a lot of the times when people argue for cessationism, it's not so much because of what the Bible says, it's more because they're having a a knee-jerk reaction to the disorder of some of the continuationist churches. But we can't correct for this and overcorrect and go into this ditch. Ever do that in the wintertime? Go off the road, overcorrect, go off the road again on the other side? That's what people are doing in the church over these gifts of the Spirit. And then finally, he says there's, there's false teaching about the resurrection and eternal life. There are people coming in, and this happened to almost every church that Paul planted. People would come in after, and they would start teaching something contrary to what he had taught. And one of the false teachings that got into Corinth was that once you're dead, you just stay dead. There is no resurrection. So the, 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 the Jewish people had a group of people called the Sadducees who didn't believe in the resurrection. Once you're dead, you're dead, they said. This faith is just to make your life better. But once you're done, you're done. And Paul goes into a beautiful discussion about what the resurrection is. And he says, just as, just as imperishable goes into the ground and grows up into new life, just as seed turns into a plant, so our mortal bodies are going to go into the ground, but then we're going to be raised to new life. And, and the reason we know that is not because it's some cleverly devised myth. It's because they saw that happen to Jesus Christ. He was not just killed. He was brutally mangled and put on a cross and disgustingly killed. And three days later, he rose and he had some marks, but he was no longer disgusting. He was resurrected. He had a resurrection body. And Paul says in this book, he is the first fruits. If it happened to Jesus, it's going to happen to all of us. And that's true for you if you're a believer or not a believer. You will be resurrected. The only difference is some will be resurrected to life and some some will be resurrected to death. And he says, so keep your eyes on Christ. He who died was raised again. You who die are going to be raised again. Those you love who have already died, they will be raised again. I know Father's Day is really hard for some. We've got some, some people who have been coming to our church lately who recently lost a dad. This is an incredibly hard day for them. 
But her dad was a believer, and so guess what? Paul would say, don't grieve as those with no hope. He will be raised again. Now, I just had to skim through 15 chapters. If you read these 15 chapters without the part that I'm about to read, you are going to say, I don't even think those people are Christians. Like when you read those 15 chapters, you're going to say, that can't be real Christians. Real Christians wouldn't do that, would they? Well, let me see a show of hands. How many of you, after coming to Christ, have done incredibly stupid things that you would not want written down forever in the Bible? I didn't know if Doris had her hand up. Yeah, okay. (laughs) We all do, right? Like, we all have things in our life that we're like, "Uh uh-uh, don't write that down, please. you imagine if you were David, King David? Like, he was known as the man after God's own heart, but every stupid thing he did is written in the Bible for us to study. The Corinthians were a mess. They were a jacked-up church, but they were a church. They were Christians. And that's what you see when you see these first nine verses. Each one of the the problems is a sermon in itself, maybe a series in itself. But what I want to do is just dwell on this gospel opening because you've got to get verses 1 through 9 of chapter 1 before you look at the Corinthians or you're going to say, they're not Christians. More than that, you've got to go back to verses 1 through 9 as a reminder before you go and interact with Christians in the world today. Have you interacted with people who call themselves Christians and you're like, I don't think so. Don't raise your hand if you You might say, there's no way they're believers. They might say the same thing about you. Before you look at people who call themselves Christians and, and just, as a matter of fact, say, well, I know that they're not Read verses 1 through 9. Remind yourself of verses 1 through 9. Before you leave your door, read verses 1 through 9. And remind yourself, we're a mess, but we have Jesus. More than that, I think you've got to go back to verses 1 through 9 over and over and over again before you interact with that Christian in the mirror. Because if you're like me, if you're like most Christians, you have looked at that person in the mirror and you've said, you may say you're a Christian, but a Christian wouldn't live the way you've done, wouldn't do the things you've done. Anybody had, had that thought? Get these first nine verses before you look at Christians in Corinth, before you look at Christians in the culture, before you look at Christians in your own home, in the mirror. Amen? Let's look at these, and I'm just gonna really quickly, really quickly, I promise, look at these four, or these nine verses with four questions. And these are four questions that you could use for any Bible study. If you're like, I don't know how to study the Bible, just remember these four questions. If you're a note taker, take notes. These four questions will help you understand almost every passage in the Bible. And we're just going to see how much we can dig out of nine verses with these four questions. Four questions are, who are God? Who is God? What has God done? Who are we? And how are we to live? You like my drawing? It's very, very fancy. Just make a table on a piece of paper. Who is God? What has God done? Who are we? And how are we to live? Now, notice the order. If you get these out of order, you're going to become some sort of crazed Christian or heretic or something. You're going to be a mess if you get these questions out of order. Have have some of you thought before, maybe before you went to church, maybe even still, have you thought Christianity is about what I am to do, how I am to live? Christianity is about the rules that I need to keep, the rules I need to make sure not to break. If that's your idea of what Christianity is, you've got the order wrong. 
If you don't ask yourself, how am I to live based on who God is, what he's done, and who you are in Christ, you're going to make a shipwreck of your faith. And you will either just tear yourself up because you can't meet the standard, or you're going to be that person, please don't be that person, that thinks you've got it figured out and you've got all the rules kept and what's wrong with all those other people. If you start with how are we to live, you are either going to be self-loathing, hate yourself, or self-righteous, proud. Both of them are exhausted. So who is God in these first nine verses? Let me read it and then unpack who is God. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given to you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him, in all speech and knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so, verse 7, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. First off, we ask, who is God? Now, if you notice, over and over and over again, it says he is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Those three words are enough to keep you thinking and dwelling and praying and thanking God and meditating for hours or days. The Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord is this word kurios in, in Greek, and it just means master. Master. And I talk about this a lot. If Jesus is your savior, he is also your boss, right? He calls the shots in your life. If he has saved you, he is your Lord. Who is God? He's my Lord. He calls the shots. But he's also the Lord Jesus. Now, do you know why Mary and, Mar- Mary and uh, John were told to call uh, Mary and Joseph? Mary and Joseph. I'm a preacher. Mary and Joseph were told to to name Jesus Jesus. Do you know why they were told to name him Jesus? Because the name means Yahweh saves. Means God saves. And in Matthew chapter 1, Joseph has just found out that Mary is pregnant, but it ain't from him, but it's also not from another guy. And he's about to just cast her off, and an angel appears to him in a dream and says, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. See, if you you don't understand who God is, that he is the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to mess up. If you only see him as Lord, if you only see him as boss, then you're only going to look to him for rules to follow. Show me the checklist of what I need to do to be a good Christian, to get into heaven, and I'm good. Or I'm not. But he's not just Lord. He's Lord Jesus, Lord Savior. He's Savior because you and I need to be saved. There is not one person in this room, there is not one person on earth, there is not one person throughout human history except for Jesus who didn't need a Savior. Even Mary who gets venerated and almost worshipped in the Roman Catholic Church, she said, our Savior has come. Our Savior. Because she needed a Savior. You need a Savior. I need a Savior. When you look at the, the, the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, you're going to see all kinds of wax sin. But there's going to be stuff that they do that you're going to say, I've done that. And if, that, if that's going to send me to hell, then I'm done. When I was a kid, I, I used to... <laughs> God bless you, Mom and Dad, if you're watching. Um, we moved all the time. We, we had to get the lay of the land when we'd move to a new place. So we would just take off and, and go and, and get in trouble. And, and me and my older brother 
it was always his idea. Me and my older brother, we would be out and we would know we're in trouble. Tell me if you've ever thought this. We're in trouble, so we might as well just keep going because if we're already gonna get punished, we might as well do more stuff since we're already gonna get punished anyway. Anybody? If you only see him as Lord and you see, oh man, I screwed up, and you don't think that there's any hope, you know that you're not gonna be able to make up for what you've done wrong. I have talked to people who said, well, I just started sinning more because I knew I was, I was going to hell anyway, so I might as well just, they said, have fun. But the, you know, by the time they're talking to me, they, they're not having fun anymore. They've seen where that sin takes them. He's not just Lord, he's Savior. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Christ doesn't mean as much to us as it does to the first century Jews. Christ was the, the Greek word for the Jewish word, Messiah. And Messiah was who they were waiting for. For hundreds of years, they waited and waited and waited because God had promised, I am sending a Messiah who is going to be the anointed one, who is going to be in the likes of David. He's going to be in the likes of Moses. He's going to be in the likes of all the priests. He's going to be the perfect prophet, priest, and king. And he is going to set right everything that's wrong. When we see who God is, that he is Lord Jesus Christ, we see that he is the one that's going to make everything broken in our lives untrue. He's going to fix everything that's broken in our life. There are things that nothing in this world can fix. I've got a friend who's, who's, whose brother was, was killed in a, in a gunfight up in Gary, Indiana. There's no, there's no justice for that. They could, they could do the death penalty. It's not going to bring the brother back. There is one who is going to make all the broken things untrue. The Lord Jesus Christ. Who is God? He is also our Father. Look at that in verse 3. Grace to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jesus saved us, the Father who was your biggest enemy is now your Father. And I know that there's been dads in the world that have not set a good example for what a godly father should be, but he is the perfect father. He was your biggest enemy, and now he has adopted you into his family. He is your father. He is your perfect father. He is your loving father. Who is God? He is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is in God the Father. He is the Father. He is also the gift giver. In verses 3 and 7, it says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who gives us the gifts of grace and peace. Verse 7, it says, uh, let me get there. You are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you might say, I'm lacking a lot of stuff. You're not lacking anything you need. You have everything you need. I have everything I need. Now, I can give you a long list of what I want that I don't have. But I have everything I need. You have everything you need. He is the gift giver. He is also the faithful one. Look at verse 9. He is the faithful one. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. God is faithful. This is great news because even after you become a Christian, you will not be perfectly faithful to God. We've already done the hand raise. I know that it's true for all of us. We will all have times, we'll all have moments, not once a year, once a decade, daily. We will have things that we do that reveal that we are not really believing that God is our Savior and Lord. But our hope is not built on our faithfulness. Our, build, our, our hope is built on the faithfulness of God. So who is God? I didn't even unpack all of it because I want to do this quickly. If you just keep meditating on these nine verses and keep looking at, okay, who is God, who is God, who is God, you're going to unpack so much more. But what has he done? It says in, in these verse, verses that he has called us, in verses 1 and 2 and verse 9, he has called us. If God hadn't called us through his spirit, you would not be a Christian. 
The Bible tells us no one, no human, no broken down sinner, no one seeks after God. If he didn't seek us and call us, we wouldn't come. But the beauty is, Jesus tells us in the Gospel of John, everyone that the Father calls through the Spirit, he comes. He calls us. What has God done? He has called us, he has sanctified us, verse 2. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, to be saints. Sanctified and saints, that's two words of the same lineage in Greek. Sanctified means set apart. In, in the Old Testament, they sanctified or consecrated or set apart the utensils that they would use in the temple worship. So the bowls, the candelabras, all that stuff was sanctified. It was just like any other bowl, utensil, candelabra, except it was set apart for holy purposes. He says, that's true of you if you're in Christ. If you are in Christ, you have been set apart for holy purposes. So when the world says do this, and it is against what God has said, you can say, well, that's fine for everybody else in the world, but I've been set apart for holy purposes. I'm not doing that. I'm not saying that. I'm not thinking that. I'm not watching that. I'm not spending my money on that. Whatever it is, you've been set aside. And that's what it is to be a saint. We don't believe that to be a saint, you have to be a super holy Christian. You are a saint, according to Paul, in almost every letter he writes, you are a saint because God has set you aside. Does that make sense? You are consecrated. What has he done? He's called us, he's sanctified us, he's united us. In these nine verses, you see it over and over and over. He talks about us uh, when, when he talks about this person being the brother. He's a brother because he's united us. Just like I was an enemy of God and you were an enemy of God, all of us were enemies of God, but in Christ we've been adopted so we're brothers and sisters. I love being brothers and sisters. You know why? I can't remember anybody's name. So if I, if I know that you're a Christian, I can just be like, hey, brother. I love it. We're united by him. It says that he is our father. And then if you look in verses four through nine, over and over it says you, 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 you. All of these are plural. It's like the sign in Florence, y'all. All of these. You all. I give thanks to my God because, uh, for you all because of the grace God has given you all in Christ Jesus. That in every way you all were enriched. When he's talking about you in this passage, every time in the Greek, it's, it's plural. Y'all. He can say y'all because we are united in Christ. What did he do? He died for us. Again, his name is Jesus. He is the Savior. How did he save? He died. What has he done? He has given us grace and peace. We see that in verse 3. He's adopted us. That's why we are sons and daughters. That's why he is our father. What has he done? He enriches us. Look at verse 5. It says that in every way you were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge. Remember when Jesus was preaching the Sermon on the Mount, he says, blessed are the poor. We were all poor. We were all impoverished. We were all destitute because of our sin. Spiritually, we had nothing. And he has enriched us. Later in this letter, Paul says, if you have Christ, you have everything. Again, he was talking to these people who were dividing over, well, we have a better leader here. No, we have a better leader here. We, we, we're, we're better because we have these gifts, and you guys just have those gifts. He's like, don't, don't you realize if you have Christ, you have everything. You don't have to squabble over a leader. All things are yours. The whole universe is yours. All that stuff that the James Webb Telescope is seeing out in the far reaches of space, it's yours. He is greatly enriching us. What has he done? What is he doing? He confirms and convinces us, verses 6 through 9. Even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful in whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He confirms and convinces us. And that's something he has to keep on doing. 
Like, there's, there's some people, some religious groups, they have confirmation class. When you're about, you know, 12, 13 years old, you get confirmed into the church. It's not like you one day say, okay, I am totally confident that I am, have a right standing with God. I'm good. Every one of us, whether you're a new Christian or an old-time Christian, you have had those times where your, your assurance is wavering. So he has to continually, that's why this book is so thick. He has to continually say, no, really, I'm enough, and I love you. He confirms and, and convinces us that we're his. He assures us. He commits to us. God is faithful. He has to because we're not. And then he fellowships with us. This is, this is one that people just skip over, but it's so amazing. In the last verse, in verse 9, he says, We were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The God of the universe who created all that stuff that the telescope has seen, who created the, the, the heavens and the earth, who created the waterfalls and the crocodiles and all this stuff, this God who created all of that and keeps everything spinning in just the right way so that we can have life on this earth, he also is fellowshipping with us. He, he is transcendent. He's outside of everything we know. And he's intimately interested in what you were worried about last night before you went to sleep. He fellowships with us. So who are we? If, if this is who God is and, and this is what God has done, who are we? We are family. We are family. We are brothers and sisters. We have one father. Who are we? We are the church. Now, the church is talked about in so many different ways in the Bible. I'm just going to bullet through these. We are an assembly. That is, we assemble together. If you're, if you're still watching only online, come assemble. We assemble together. We're the visible and invisible church. That means there are people in every church body who are not yet Christians. We just keep saying, come on in, and you're going to hear the gospel every week. And then within the visible church, there's an invisible church. That is all the Christians. When it says that we are the church, it, it's talking about the global and historic church. That means we are connected. We are brothers and sisters with the brothers and sisters in Ukraine that we've been talking about. We are also brothers and sisters with the Christians 200 years ago. And the, sometimes in, in church life now, we look back at those Christians and we say, how in the world did they think that that was okay to do this or that? Some of, some of my heroes in the faith were slave owners. How in the world was that okay? 200 years from now, if God tarries, there's going to be Christians that look back and say, how in the world did they think it was okay to say they love Jesus and this? Just like we look back at Corinth and say, what a mess. We're united with all these messy souls. Who are we? We are the saved ones. Jesus is Yahweh saved. He sanctified us. He's called us to him. He's given us grace. He's made us guiltless. This is all in these nine verses. Who are we? We are set apart. So we need to live like it. Who are we? We are unified. Who are we? We are grace recipients. There's no measuring the grace that God's given you. There's no measuring it. Sometimes when we are just at our lowest, it's because we have lost the gratitude for the grace that we've been given. Spend 10 minutes thinking about what he's given you. Just 10 minutes. If you are a Christian, 10 minutes of thinking about what he's done for you, and you will want to sing. You will want to praise he has not only given us peace, but now we, because of that, we are peacemakers. If somebody described you at work, would they say, that's a peacemaker? If, if one of your family members described you, as soon as you leave the family reunion, you get in your car, they're all talking, oh man, she's a peacemaker. Is that what they're saying? Because of who God is and what he's done, that's who we are. 
See, 1 Corinthians doesn't say, do this so that you will be this type of person. He's, he's saying, you are this person, so be this way. Live into what he's called you. Because of what he's done, who he is, we are gifted, we are assured, we are sustained. Now the rest of the book answers that last question. How are we to live? The last question, how are we to live, is an important question. We do need to turn away from sin. We do need to turn toward holiness. But if you try to do that without being rooted in your identity in Christ, you will not live the Christian life. You will live a religious, pharisaical life. You will be obnoxious. You will be hard to live around. Because you either are self-righteous or you're just mopey all the time because you're like, well, maybe I'll get into the side door of heaven. I guess you'll have to let me in, Jesus, you know. No, we should celebrate and live victoriously. That's what this book is about. But if you don't get the gospel, you don't get that. Amen? If we are secure in Christ, if we are united in Christ, we will be conformed to Christ. Let's pray. Father God, at the, at the end of this beautiful book, there is a wonderful, wonderful sentence for those who are in Christ, but it also a warning for those who are not yet yours. Lord, at the end of this book, Paul says, if anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. But he also says, grace, the grace of the Lord be with you, as he talks to all of us who are in Christ. Or there is, there is no difference to the outsider looking in as to whether or not we are yours or not. We don't, we don't have a glow about us if we're Christians. We sometimes screw up in incredible ways as Christians. We embarrass and, and let down the family name of Christian with our sin. And yet, there's love for us. There is no curse for us. Because you took the curse, Jesus. So Lord, as we go, as we read this book for ourselves this week, please help us to see all of the beauty of who you are. Please help us to, to bask in the gracious gifts that you have given and all the things that you've done. Please help us to know who we are so that we know how to live. Lord, I ask these things with hope, with excitement that you will change us if we will change our outlook, if we will look at these verses and let them change us, Lord. There's nothing that we can't do. Lord, help us, heal us, Shape us, guide us, direct us, correct us. All for your glory and for our good. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, go be the church. I love you guys.